That's right. Next, right. Thing, next to Big T. Well, we're going to have that discussion in a little bit. Right? I'm not going to sit this way. I'm going to stay over here. Okay. Where do you want me to sit this way? You're fine, Tommy. Wherever you want to sit. I'm going to sit. It's your place. I'll sit on the counter here. Tommy. Tommy, microphone. As the world's strongest man, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> and raw Jim, double arm. I'm at home. Wherever I go, the earth shakes beneath my feet. I am the king of all I survey. She's up in shape, bro. This is the beast game. <laughs> I've ruled the world with straight things for more than 30 years. 35 to be exact. I started in 79. Powerlifting in 76. I won the national championships in 78. World Championships in 79. World Strongest Man in 80, 81, 82, 83, the World Championships in Powerlifting. Somehow or other, I was uninvited for the World Strongest Man. Are you recording? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> well, excuse me. I didn't know where the microphone was. <laughs> Is that showing up? It's a bit of an echo, isn't it? It's all good. So much to talk about, so many things learned, so many things experienced. I've got a lot I'd like to share with you. I'd also like you to ask later that I share things that you remember, enjoy, experience, have comprehension and understanding of within strength and fitness and all the things that you do. I'd kind of like to start off, gosh, that's a wonderful voice. <laughs> I said to Lou Ferrigno last year, he was about to have his ears fixed. I said, Lou, after your operation, I want to speak with you so that you can hear how beautiful my voice is. <laughs> he smiled and said, go on, Bill. I get so much respect from Lou Ferrigno. I watch him with other people. I don't really see him give him that much respect. I think because Lou, of all the bodybuilders, was one of the guys that truly competing in World Strongest Man and actually competing where Franco Colombo kind of just showed up as a little guy. Uh, Lou really was strong. Was that one competition one night in Bellevue, Washington? Bodybuilding and a number of things in the convention. I took the Thomas Inch dumbbell, and all day through the convention, Lou kept coming up to it and tried to pick it off the ground. I couldn't quite pick it up. That night on the stage, I took it with a little bit of smoke and mirrors and dry ice. I simply grabbed it and snatched it to arm's length overhead. And he said, how did you do that? How did you get a strap on it so fast? I said, Lou, I can't tell you. I told you I'd have to kill you. But of all these experiences, many will come out this evening. You might quite possibly know more. Did you ever hear anybody stammer or stutter? Well, uh, I wonder if they talk like this. Uh, yeah, one of the things uh, that, uh, that we'll probably uh, uh, talk about, uh, did you ever hear anybody say ah, like out of 30 words, five or six times? You want to go kick him in the face. Now that I'm in Europe and training again with Darren Sabin, I want to just go up and chin somebody. I don't know why. Jane and I were talking about today, you know, this lady pulled off the front of said, let's just pull her over, I'll chin her. <laughs> I mean, that's for a man, woman, or child, right? You deserve the shit, you get the shit. So, one of the things I think I'd kind of like to start with is one of my most important <laughs> concepts Precepts ideas is where you've been, where you're now, and where you're going. It's so important to know that. It's so important to under, have a complete comprehension and understanding of those three things. Because how are you going to get to where you want to go unless you honestly assess where you are and then accurately have information on where you've been? Because so many try to get to a point so quickly, I think, 
our athletes of today think that that comes out of a syringe and uh, more is better and more, 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 and really saturation and all the rest of it doesn't work. So where did I start? And I, I think that's an important beginning. I was born in 1953. And yeah, I was 59 years old when I was born. You guys are celebrating 1916 and your involvement in the war. My father fought in that war. My father fought in that war, the First World War. When I heard about that, the change here would be in some of the culture today of your area. It really impacted me. He had to be 59. He was a wonderful guy, he really was. We had a lot of fun in our family as we grew up. That thing's not going to hear me about the movie over here. But, well, we had a little fun, actually, because there was a lot of action around our house. Things flying, like at Christmas, we'd see the turkey fly out the front window. Maybe the presents go in the garbage and get burned. Uh, the fun that we had was from the word dysfunctional. So if you look closely with it, you'll see this word fun. And as I grew up, there were things happening that were really kind of tough to deal with. I was never taken to a sporting event. I was never encouraged in a positive way. I can remember many times running out of the house to get away and in the middle of the yard, driveway, feeling a brick in the middle of the back. He was a mason, a bricklayer, and at 65 and a little more could still win a brick like you wouldn't believe. There was always shovels and rakes and pitchforks right around the house. And when I'm talking to young people, I can describe to them what a pitchfork sounds like. The, the five little twang, twangs from a pitchfork come up across your head. Pretty interesting. Not something you'd want to experience yourself. As I was growing up, we escaped when I was in the fifth grade. I was 10 years old. I saw a guy at the school, I thought, oh boy, my savior. It's a little like Shane. 200 pounds, nowhere near as big as him. He was shredded. He looked like a skinned frog. On Friday night, he on a slow pitch baseball game, he could knock the ball out of the park. It sounded like the bat was gonna be smashed. I stood in the outfield and I heard that ball come off the bat every time he hit a home run. Whap! And I'd stand out there and that ball would come off the bat and the sound was incredible. It ripped the fabric of the universe. It had such great power and velocity. I was so impressed with this guy, Mr. Knox. As he strutted around like a young peacock at 25 or 6 years old, just out of college, he was the geography teacher. We had a half a dozen classes. I was not in his class in the fifth grade. We had a track meet. I was so excited because my one mentor, my one hero that I wanted to be like an emulate was Jim Thorpe. Does anybody remember from Carlisle, Pennsylvania? A wonderful man from the turn of the century, 1904 Olympic Games, Jim Thorpe. Anybody remember him? No? You do? He won the decathlon, he won the pentathlon, he played professional baseball and professional football. He was unbelievable. But other than him, I thought, okay, my dad's not going to help me with anything. Maybe this fifth grade teacher will. And we had a track meet. He ran it. There were a couple kids in my class that had flunked twice. So they were 14, 13. I was 11. I won the 50 meter. I won the 100 meter. And I won the 400 meter. And a couple days later, I was sort of sports oriented in mind. And I came into school and I heard this wonderful playing. It was beautiful. Gosh, the Raw Chimps got such fantastic dumbbells, I can't make them climb. Mr. Dodson was in the locker room, the girls' locker room, a place I always wanted to sneak into at least once or twice and just look around and see, like, you know, you never know what's laying around in there, right? The girls are all gone. But I snuck in and I asked if I could watch him lift his weights. He said, okay, you don't just sit down and be quiet, which is kind of hard for me to do because I was the sort of guy that was always a bit of ADD, attention deficit. They didn't have rhythm back in the day, so it was hard for me to sit still. 
As I sat there and watched him lift his weights, he didn't really describe and say what he was going to do, but I saw him taking a bar from the ground and putting it up over his head. He didn't tell me it was a power clean to the shoulders. He didn't tell me it was a two-hand barbell press. He didn't say a damn thing. He didn't describe or explain any of the technique that he was using. Getting his hips down, his head and shoulders back, and doing that wonderful clean. At 150, he did a couple reps. At 165, he did a rep. He did 175. I could see him inching towards his own weight. Well, at 185, he missed the weight. He seemed quite frustrated as he sat it down. The look on his face was almost indescribable of just, damn. I guess he thought he was a badass. He had the kind of head and shoulders, the way he walked around and carried himself. He always acted like one. He seemed like a great athlete. As he set the bar down and started to take the plates off the end after I'm doing the collar, I quickly interjected and said, can I try my weight? He said, all right, Joe, what do you weigh? He said, I weigh 50 kilos. He left that much on the bar. And I quickly walked up to it, took it to my shoulders and pressed it over my head. I, could, I did it once. I could have done it twice. As a matter of fact, it was such a toy. I could have done it five times or more. And I set it back down on the ground and I waited. I waited for quite a while, it seemed to me. At this point in my life, after 50 years, it seems like an eternity that I waited for him to give me some sort of positive response. Bill, nice job. Going back tomorrow, I'll teach you squat. I'll teach you two arm curl, upright row, front raise, anything to separate muscle groups and add a few exercises to teach you how to weight train. You know, I find myself in front of 500 kids and it rings in my ear. I went to 10 schools in one day talking to young people and it kept, kept ringing in my ear. And then I went to 15 schools in 30 hours, 18 different schools in 32 hours, 27 schools in three days, trying to motivate and inspire young people in a way where this man would not do it for me. He simply said, now you have to leave and don't come back. So I did leave. And as I was growing up, I was ridiculed constantly. I was from a divorced family. My toes stuck through the ends of my shoes, and the shoes were about a pound and a half, two dollars. I had two pairs of pants and three shirts. They had holes in them. People called me pumpkin head, mush mush, because I was like Humpty Dumpty. If I was at the end of the wall and they pushed me off, I'd go splitch. I often tell young people that the tongue is the rudder of your life. The words that you utter have a way of steering you just like a big ship. And the words that these kids were using on I me mean, were like a whip. Oftentimes you can either be positive or really hurt somebody. And these kids just kept beating me down. My dad beat me down. He said, Bill, didn't even use my name. He just said, you will always be nothing more than horse shit. Your horse shit now will be horse shit for the rest of your life. I think after assessing twice world powerlifting champion, three of the four world records for many years, three times in a row the world's strongest man, commentator on television for 20 years on ESPN, CBS Sports, and the, the thousand different schools that I went to to inspire and motivate young people to shoot for the stars, who dare to dream, to hang out with the condors and stay away from the chickens and the turkeys. I believe I proved them wrong. That negative reinforcement seemed to work with me. I tried it with my own son. He was born in 1986, so he'll be 30 years old in July 2nd. He's such a wonderful young guy. I tried to motivate him in a number of different ways. And finally, he said to me at about eight years old, Dad, tell me I'm great. Pat me on the back. Give me a trophy. But don't use that negative stuff on me, because it's not going to work. So as I grew up, I finally found a mentor. I was ineligible to do any kind of sports. My grades weren't good enough. My high school coach allowed me to wrestle as a freshman. My first wrestling match, I shot in deep on a guy, up underneath him, lifted him up over my head, put my hand over his head, clasped my arms, and sat his shoulders on the back, on, on the ground with him. It wasn't very long before I was on the varsity team as a freshman. Playing football as a freshman, we had five games. How many of you guys ever watched American football? A little bit. Well, 
as a freshman, I was playing the line. And the fifth game of the year, we won the first four, we're winning that one. I took the ball from a guy carrying it and went 75 yards the other way. The sophomore year, coming back, we went and played 10 games. They said, Bill, line up behind the quarterback and set him. And just put your hands like this when you run to the line. We're going to hand you the ball. The holes go one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. And you're the three back. 31, three, five. I carried the ball a great deal against one team. I carried 11 times in a row. We won all 10. But something happened kind of unusual as my junior year was about to start. I was the fullback on the varsity. We played two scrimmages against two different teams. 30 plays against one, 30 plays against the other. Our quarterback could pass. He could pitch out. They could do a reverse. There was 25 or 30 different plays. We ran one play. Bill to the right. Bill to the left. Bill to the right. Bill to the left. We smashed this team. I ran all over them. We, we went 30 plays against the next team. We could have passed. We could have run the tailbacks. We could have done all sorts of things instead. Bill to the right, Bill to the left. We got to the first non-conference game of the year, and we were 18 and 0 at that point. We hadn't lost in 18. They did not give me the ball one time. We lost. That night of practice, and then on Monday the next week, when we went through our scrimmages and our plays, I hurt the guys on my team. I knocked the living crap out of them. I was pissed. At the end of the practice, we had to run sprints, 40 meters. And the cadence is as simple as this. Everybody gets down. So it's down, sit, hut one, hut two. We'll count the distance between hut one and hut two. Everybody goes on hut one. I was defiant. I was pissed. I went on hut two. Everybody was at least two meters ahead of me when I started. I caught them at the 20, 25 yard line, passed them, got over the 40 meter line, turned around, put my hand down, was ready to go. We ran 10, then we ran 20. The guys around me were crying and dying. Then we ran 10 more. And they're saying, Kansler, start on two, give us a break. I started on one. Instead, I kept starting on two. We ran 10 more for 40, 40 meter dashes. Everybody dragged themselves to the locker room. The practice was over. My coach was pissed. I was pissed. Without him saying a word, I went out and ran laps. The first, not, the first conference game of the year, right before halftime, two 15 minute quarters, 15 seconds, seconds left, 18 seconds left. We're on the 32 yard line. It's third down. We were not close enough to kick the field goal. We can't move the ball. We hadn't scored. They put, I was on the bench. They put me in for one play. I went 32 yards to the score. That night we scored three times. I scored all three of them. There's still I in team, but there's an I in win. And if you give Kazmaier the ball, chances are you're gonna win. My coach finally figured that out. You know, I was really fortunate as a youth, abused at home, Abused at school. I even got abused by an uncle who was a telephone linesman. And he cut trees after school and on weekends. He was actually the first strength coach in history, from what I understand. Because it was 1965. I'm 12, 13 years old. He took me out and we started cutting trees down. We could never get close to the tree. We always had to be cut them by the lake. And I had to drag them from the lake up to the truck. The first two branches he cut off were huge. I went to carry one. He said, grab them both. I dragged them up to the truck. He said, put them in the center. Leave all the green, hang off the back. He said, I had to cut the rest of the tree down. I went to drag two more branches. He said, stop and drop those. Put four or five on one side, four or five on the other side. Reach to the bottom. Pick them up, carry them up to the truck, load them, and run back. What a coach. What a strength coach. What a mentor. This guy, another shredded frog, could climb a tree above like that. So we loaded, I loaded this truck after we cut down a couple trees. 
I rake everything up, put it up on top of the truck. He cut the logs so that I could either carry them or roll them to the truck and pick them up and put them in. But when we got to the dump to dump this load of brush and trees, I sat in the truck for about 30 seconds thinking, what do you do when you go to the dump to unload? What do you do? Push the button? Maybe push in the clutch, pull the plunge for the hydraulic, let off the clutch, that goes like this, right? Well, after 30 seconds, he says, get out, we're going to unload the truck. I'm thinking, hmm, this truck's pretty old, it's like in the 50s. It didn't have a lift. I was the lift. <laughs> those two limbs we put on the bottom, I dug all the stones and rakings off and exposed those and reached down and he pulled and I pulled. And we pulled and we pulled and we pulled and we pulled until finally this package of brush tilted. He then got back inside the truck as I was lifting for all I was worth and he popped the clutch and we dumped the load. A strange coach like that was somebody who really taught me how to work. So when I showed up on the football field, in high school, I knew what to do. You know, I really believe something's only heavy if you think it is. Something's only hard if you think it is. You might remember me throwing the barrels on the back of the truck when Jeff Capes and all the rest of the guys were picking them up and carrying them and loading them. My barrels were empty. I put sticky on my hands and simply went and tossed them on the truck. The preparation that I went through with this guy, learning how to work, carried me through my life, carried me through all my sports. It helped me a great deal to understand that my capacity for work was far greater than I, anyone else is far greater than I realized my own would be. Imagine going into some training, carrying a 20 kilo vest, ankle weights, lace weights, dumbbells, up and down the stadium steps. Anybody count their heartbeats in here for when you're training for cardio stuff? Nobody? Do you? 25 beats in 10 seconds. First set five of the stadium. Then 30. Then 35. Then 40. The last set, fifth set of five reps. 41 beats in 10 seconds. Who does good math? That's 246. Who knows if the heart's fibrillating at 225? Whoever trains like that. Who beat John Paul Samerson? carrying and dragging the sack and was the only guy to finish in Budapest. What did I do halfway through the race when I had the knife through his liver up into his stomach and heart and all I needed to do was twist it. I was so far ahead of him I was surely beating him and killing him. I looked back and I laughed at him and I said ha 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 and I did. I pulled the knife off and I fell down. I got back up and I fell down. I got back up and I fell down and I finished the race. Five minutes after my heart rate was 225. I pushed myself that hard. The EMT said to me, Bill, I lived a purple. I don't know what's happening in my body, but my heart rate wasn't coming back down. I think it was like a cup of coffee that I took before the race. The EMT said, Bill, if, if you leave, we'll see you there. You're not coming back. So after high school and moving on into college, I was going to be the latest, greatest lawyer's on to pull back and I ran into a word that I didn't really understand very well when I got to college, and that was politics. My coach told me they wouldn't have a football team if I didn't go there to the Madison, University of Wisconsin at Madison. But there were other schools around the NCAA that said, if Bill Kazmaier's name shows up on a Big Ten roster, we'll file a formal rule complaint because we know he's not eligible. So I had to wait for, until my second year to play football. And when I did, they moved me into the line. Has anybody watched the movie lately called Concussion? How many of you guys? Tell me out. Everybody, everybody. It's about the guys playing American football. The guy they start off with, Mike Webster, was the first guy they put me against when they moved me to a tackle. He was the center with who nice the ball. This guy was so tough. In practice, in every game, he knocked down the, the line in the nose guard in front of him. He knocked down the linebacker to be chasing and he back the corner. Every play. He was brutal. When I lined up against the three of them, I had to hit him, move him, shed him, and make the tackle, and I hit it three times on the line of scrimmage. Not bad, only there were tears in my eyes. I had goosebumps, my hair was standing on end. And I felt like somebody hit me in the head with a sledgehammer. And that was three plays. And this guy did this thousands and thousands of times, over 16 years, playing in the NFL. 
I'm so happy I didn't make it in football. I became disgusted when they moved me into the line and I quit the football team. I told those coaches they were number one. Where's my camera? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really hurt that, didn't I? Well, I lived above a bar, I was a bouncer, and I was kind of, how do I put it? Really not lifting weights, not doing anything. Kind of down and out. Maybe a, a bit of a, of a muck and mire, a bit of a problem in my life. Working at a couple different bars as a bouncer. A couple of the guys saw what I could lift. The first time I walked in the college football locker room, uh, in the gym, I deadlifted 600 pounds, 280. First time I ever saw it. The first time I bent when I got to college, I did 300. Uh, six weeks ago, two months later, I did 400 pounds, 180. A couple of the guys invited me to come up to the YMCA and they said, no, we'll leave a wedge in the back door. And they did. And I snuck in again and again. Within about a month, I squatted 180 to 10 deep squats. No wraps, no belt, I didn't have a belt. And started powerlifting. Well, they taught me about five things in the YMCA. How many of you guys know that England and Europe started the Y? Young Men's Christian Association had started the in England in the late 40s, 170 years old. Well, they scholarship a lot of people, they help a lot of people to grow and learn. They taught me five things. Squat, bench press, deadlift, total. One other really important thing. In the squat, as you know, I went 422 and a half. The day I tripled, I want to say 410, I was ready to do the world record of 975. When I did the 300 kilo world record bench press, I had hurt myself with a 633. How many of you guys have done kilo conversions? Is it room or not? I tripled that in the bench. Hurt my back, got down to 575. Did five reps and said, yeah, I'm hurt. The meat's two weeks away, I don't know what to do. I just did a set of 10 with 500 and went to the meat. Set the world record bench. When I did the squat of 930, my top squat, I heard something rip in my hip. My doc had been shooting with marking every workout for six weeks and come to my gym. I thought I'd better not go up to the world record. That day I did 848 for the world total record of 1,100 kilos. My world record was 887. I went to pull that weight. I pulled it so hard it literally came out of my hand at the top. That would have been 2479. Without getting hurt in the bench press, I probably would have been 2500. Another 20 pounds. And if I would have taken that last squat, that would have been 25, 30, 40, about 11, 50 that day. If I ever would have had a bar that was big enough that I could fit inside of it, I had so much pectoral, shoulders, and reps. I was so inflexible from all of this that I really couldn't get inside of a bar. They made a Pasadena bar. Dave Pasadena squatted 1,000 pounds on your bed. The bar was thicker and longer and easier to get more comfortable to get inside of it. I'm thinking more shoes, hand grenades, and could have, should have. I have a lot of theories on that stuff and uh, a lot of experience that tell me that I probably could have totaled 1,200. <laughs> I went up to Rick, Ryan Vanilli, Vanilli a couple of weeks ago in California. And Ryan has done, I think, a 738 bench press, raw, or something up there. Maybe he's planning on doing that, I'm not sure. With that 633 triple and getting injured, if I wouldn't have been injured, I would have probably done a 655 double, which would have yielded 685. If I would have stopped doing squats and deadlifts for just two or three months, that double at 655 would have probably been 685 or 95, which would have yielded a single 35 over that of seven and a quarter. That's the world record now, 35 years later. If I would have bench pressed, just bench pressed, no squat and deadlift for a year, I would have done 800 pounds in bench press. I believe that. I told that to Ryan. Ryan, I was very nice to him at the time, but I said, look, I'm just different. I'm Cavs. And he said, you know what? I get from this, I need to do more reps. Here was my bench press workout back in the day. Who really liked bench? Anybody? Did you relate to this? Two plates for 20, three plates for 20, four plates for 20, five plates for 10, five and a half plates for five quick sets of five. Four sets of 10 coming on the way back down. Two high and wide, two narrow and low. Four and three quarters plates for 10s. 
one of each of those sets of stop benches. One set just to finish, to kind of pump up. How many reps do you think I did on my 16th set in bench press just for a flush with 195? synchronicity going on where I really understood my form. I broke down bench press. One of my biggest keys is simply to take a picture of a lift. Take that picture, film it, develop it. Remember when we developed pictures? You put them under a fluid in a dark room and all that. Well then you take that picture and cut it out and make it into a puzzle. And each of those puzzles are, within that puzzle, each of those pieces has a relevance and an importance in the lift. You look at that piece, you understand what its job is, you put it back into the form, into the puzzle, you work it, you try it, you take it apart, look at it again, and you work on some of those pieces. You, you're only as strong as your weakest link in the chain. You try to make your weaknesses into strengths, or at least bring them up. Take it apart, put it together, take it apart, put it together. That worked for me so well that I was able to improve it in self fast many guys. One of the things I did on, for heavy deadlifts, I did light squats before. You know, you know so much about me already. Well, I did three sets of 15 for a light squat before going eight and a quarter. What would that be, about 370 or something? For fives, 825 pounds. Before my floor deadlifts, I wanted to flush my legs, get them pumped, get warmed up, save my back. So I did high bar narrow stance squats, three sets of 15. What kind of weight do you think I used? 300 kilos. So when you see Tom Platts doing uh, the body power 15, 20 years ago, and I'm standing behind him going, full shit, full shit. <laughs> he's got 500 pounds in the bar, so he says, right? For 23 reps, he's retired. He never did 23 reps with 500 pounds while he had a hold of his ass. You look at the five, the six plates that are on the bar. The first two are about this big. They're like double size fifties. They're huge. And then there's a point with a nice three uh, spikes on it. And then you look at those other four plates. They look like they have a piece of tin that has this nice shape of a plate. And did you guys ever hear what a duck sounds like? Do you ever see a duck walk? Did you ever see a weight move and squat at 500 pounds? Does it not move the bar? That bar is moving. Did everybody, anybody watch somebody's trunk when you're moving forward and backward and compensating in squat? And you look at the third rep and the 10th rep and the 17th rep and nothing changes? I call bullshit. It was on Facebook a couple of days, weeks ago. Everybody commented, man, unbelievable. I want to go squat. This really fires me up. Old school, that was great. Oh shit, oh shit. It was fake weight. So, real weights, fake weights. I tried to lift a lot of, a lot of real weights. Don't we call it at the time? Uh, I was standing behind him to authenticate. <laughs> Brad Hatfield put it all together, body power. I didn't realize it until I saw it. Years later, I looked at the weight and said, Damn, he doesn't move. His body hardly moves. The 17th rep looks like a toy. And then he gets down to 23 and he sort of falls forward like, yeah, I'm supposed to be really tired. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> anyway, tons of stuff to talk about. A lot of experiences you can see that I'm a bit spontaneous. And I'm all over, the, all over the place with the things that I talk about because there are so many different experiences and things that I did while I was competing that really have a kind of a bearing on what I'm doing uh, in my life. And the things in my life have a lot to do with where the hell is my phone? Did I leave my phone in the office? Now I'm not going to know what time it is. 
It's all seven like. <laughs> oh never mind. Tommy, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah, yeah. So we'll go till we'll go about a full hour and then uh, till 7.30 and then do question and answer and stuff. Uh, but some of the things that I learned about lifting kind of came from my experience, my work experience, from my sports. One of the things I think for the ladies that you guys would like to share as coaching with young people as they're coming up. I rode my bicycle a lot when I was a kid. And I played it, jumped, climbed trains, jumped fences, ran like the wind through the fields, up and down the hills, through the swamp, up the gravel pit, throwing rocks at the big car down the road, 50 years old and all rusty. And I rode my 20 inch bicycle. Now that's one with the little wheels, one speed. And this is my leg. And here's my buddy with three speed on a 15, 20 mile ride with me. Who's gonna be faster? Who's developing fast switch muscle fiber? That's one of the reasons why I was able to do things the way I did. It was also my attitude towards the weight. I actually loathed the weight. While I was in the gym, like this, I would grab three 45 pound plates. And before I went to squat or deadlift, I'd lift them over my head. As I slammed them down, I'd say, BAM! And that was just sort of kind of getting ready. You saw me in the World's Strongest Man competition. I measure a man by, oftentimes by how he reacts on a bad day. And when you fall down, do you wait for pity? Do you let people walk all over you? Or are you like shame? Just pop back up, step back, make a plan, execute the plan, go either over, under, around, or hell, just back up and go right through the obstacle. How many people are ready and willing to overcome? Adversity. In World's Strongest Man competition, they gave us hot gold steel bars. I took a huge one and just went, ah, ah, and was the only one to bend the bar. The next year, they said, Come on back, use the same stuff. And when I grabbed a hold of this bar, it was really silver. I said, What's this? They said, It's the same stuff, it's just better for TV. It's not so dirty. Well, the difference between hot gold and cold rolled steel is quite a lot about three or four times strength. I put towels on my head and the announcer said, oh, he's trying to protect his head. No, I was trying to get a leverage advantage and reach as high as I possibly could to pull down against that bar. As I put it behind my neck and I started to push, I made a bit of a mistake. I went over the top, I kept pushing and pushing. I used the calves focus and BAM! Bicep, deltoid, pectoral, right off. Oh, I believe it was fire! Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> Cold roll freaking steel. Took the pack, the deltoid, and the bicep. What do you do then? Well, shit, there's four events left. I'm leading this, this whole competition. I guess I just gotta lay there and let somebody pity me. We're at the Playboy Club. Maybe I can get some bunnies to come and rub their tails on me and make me feel a little better. Gosh, that's what everybody would do. Poor pitiful me. Are you freaking kidding me? I'm cast. I jumped right back up. Four events left. Two firsts, a third and a fourth. You can do anything you want. Right, Shane? Nothing holds you back. Nothing holds you down. In one of the competitions, I did an 870 for getting big weight in pounds. I came up in a squat. Boom! I pulled my hamstring. Adductor, damn. Well, what do you do? Stop lifting? Next weight's 920, I'm not gonna stop. I wrap it up and I go with a bigger one. Oh, oh, didn't make that one. You ever have an old shit moment? I've had a few in my life, that was one of them. I came out from underneath that bar, walked away and said, what am I gonna do now? Because the next lift is, is deadlift. Well, how do you do a good deadlift? Anybody want to describe a form for me? What happens with the body? Do you do any Boltons? High hips? Just kind of full? Like some of our strong men are doing today? Or do you get down like I learned how to deadlift from four Russians? Pizarenko, Rieger, Rachmanov, Alexeyev. Knees over the ankles, hips down, head and shoulders back. Big hip flexors. Strong quad. Boom! Did I just describe a perfect deadlift? So 
So how, do, how was I going to be deadlift with two torn hamstrings? When I went to use the warm up of 900, I'm sorry, 300 pounds, 140 kilos, I can't, I can't do it. So I drag it up with straight legs. The opener is 700 pounds. I pull it up, it looks like I'm done. You know, we go through this cadence 700, 800, 900. It's me and Ernie Hackett. He's doing sumo, one inch. Boop. Second time. Going, shit, why am I so tall? I'm dragging it over. 925, 950, 975, 1000, 1025, 1050, 1055. Two torn hamstrings. The vegetable man is how you react on a bad day. I'm totally fucked and I'm gonna win. Because that's my title, my trophy, and my check. But then I'm so enlightened. I get our internet warriors. Thank you so much for enlightening me. They write in and say, Bill Kazmaier needs to bend his legs in his squat. <laughs> that's gonna help him a lot. He'd be so much stronger. Surely, if he only knew how to deadlift properly. Here's the funny story. Dave Brown, strong man from the late 90s, spent five years to break that record. Finally, at 1,060, he came up to me. By the way, does anybody ever remember video games and arcade games from America back in the 70s and 80s? One called Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man? Gobble, 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 chase this thing around the floor, gobble, gobble. What happened when it hit? Hate the thing. Anybody remember the noise it made? <laughs> well, when Dave Brown came up to me and said I did 1,060 pounds, I felt so bad because I popped his bubble that day. I said, Dave, here, I got a few guns. Take this one. It's a 22. A little 22 gun. You guys got a lot of guns, right? I probably have about 100. Probably have 30,000 rounds of ammunition. I got one gun. It's got. 30, 40, and 50 round clips. I've got 900 rounds loaded for that 45 caliber. You guys got that kind of stuff, don't you? I mean, we need it over in America. <laughs> so, that's a joke, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. So, so, I give him this 22 and I tell him, okay, shoot yourself in that hamstring, shoot yourself in the other hamstring, now go do your 1,060, then you beat my record. How'd that sound of the machine go? <laughs> Oh well. So, that drives it home a lot to me. The measure of man. I'm kind of amazed at Sean. I got to spend just a little bit of time with him today. He came and picked me up by the airport. We drove around a little bit. And uh, he brought me over here. And told me a few things about your country and history. And, but then he also told me a little bit about himself. Doing triple, triple, triple body weight deadlift. And our biggest guys today are doing double and just a little bit more and calling themselves the strongest man. He's doing a two and a half times body weight for bench press. I was one of the best ever and did a double at 330 to get to 300 kilos, 330 pounds. I like to think that guys are tougher than they, than they act. I like meeting real men. I think in your country there are some guys, Tommy from his lifting, competing, as I get to know some of you other guys, what you've done and where you've been, where you've been, where you are, where you're going, and what you want to do in your lives and how you want to get there. I figured out a few paths. That, that path of least resistance seems to be what every human wants to take. Well, I wanted adversity. I wanted a fight. I wanted Sigmundson. When we're doing log press and you see me with a binge on my right arm, that's because eight weeks before the, in the in a wrestling match, I tore my tricep off. I met them on the field of battle, the Muscle Power Classic. Jeff Capes, Jamie Reeves, John Paul Sigerson. And I beat their ass when I was supposed to be in a cast. A week after I, my doctor did the surgeries, I had the cast off. He said, Bill, where'd the cast go? I said, Doc, I can't move my arm with a cast on. He said, that's the general idea. At eight weeks, I'm competing. At 12 weeks, I take a 242 pound, 120, is that 110 pound 
242 mile log for 38 reps, 12 weeks after surgery. What are you going to do tomorrow, Sean? In deadlift, how much? 300 or so. You're going to take it easy, right? The reason I didn't take it easy is because I couldn't feel the nerve in my elbow. At 16 weeks in Budapest, Hungary, guys might be doing 20, 30 pound dumbbells. I'm taking the world record log to my shoulders and press it over my head without setting on top of my head. Those of you who love John Paul from Iceland, good form, torn up body, an iron will, refusing to lose. You know, speaking of will, now that you understand what that really is, you have a comprehension, I challenge you to use the three strongest words in your vocabulary. I can, I will. I can, I will, I can, I will, I can, I will, I can, I will. Guess what? You're empowered. You can do anything. You're convinced. Run into the most picture of your mind. See yourself doing a lift again and again and again and again. With your eyes closed. See the gym that you're about to go into. Hear the sounds. Smell. Ooh, smell those smells. Aren't they beautiful? Sweat. The must of hard work. Dedication, desire, determination. All just oozing out of your good body. After doing that again and again through positive mental rehearsal, I never miss in my mind, I never miss in the gym, I never miss in the competitions. One time, I had a little bit of a problem. Just a little oh shit moment. We didn't, we didn't have SPDs back in my day. But we did find that if you took a jock strap top and pulled it really tight, you couldn't rip it. But it was only about that tall. And it was oh so thin that it wouldn't tear. So I had two different guys wrap my knees. And as they did, with 900 pounds, as I came up, oh shit, I twisted, corkscrewed. Can you imagine two little dwarfs, each with a razor blade in their hand, and 10,000 road bands stressed with 900 pounds on your back? And there they are, the little gargoyles with a smile go, hello. <laughs> There I go to my face. There's six guys standing behind me. I don't know where the weight went. I fell to my face going, Chuck! That was my friend's name, Chuck. But maybe I wasn't calling his name out, but it was close to it. <laughs> These guys caught the weight behind me. They were six angels. They carried me off the platform. What do you do then? You go to the hospital, right? I mean, you got major hematoma. You're bleeding internally. Best thing to do is just ice. Get your feet up. Relax. Hobble back to the locker room. Start loading up the bench press, warming up. Because that's the next lift, right? They literally carried me up the stairs. I hobbled to the bench. My legs looked like balloons. They lowered me down to the bench. How much do you think of it? 200 kilos? Two times? 215, what's that? Is this your No, this is the world record that day. 252? I don't know, 639 pounds. Thanks for your help. Keep it going. He's not comfortable. Yeah, is it 290? 639 is the world record. So, you know, you kind of get the idea that. Hey, maybe this Kazmaier is somebody that's just a little bit different than the rest who came through on our planet. Maybe he's not the greatest ever, but he may not be the strongest ever. But let's write that word out. S-T-R-O-N-G-E-S-T. -E strongest. One little dab on the A, O, becomes A. Read it again. S-T-R-A-N-G-E-S-T. -E no doubt I'm probably the strangest strong man who ever lived. I claim that title. I stand before you. I argue as a dude is the biggest about who's the strongest ever. 
care to hear about that? I was kind of knocked on the brain out. I'll tell you about it. After being the world's strangest for so many years, I was actually the first that used a bench press shirt. Believe it or not, I went to the World Championships wearing a 4X through the loom t shirt. I looked at the box, the rest of the shirts, there was a 2X in the box. Well, I had a 60 inch chest. 2X is tight as all shit. I mean, I slipped that thing on, pulled it up and over, pulled it up my arms. I walked around like this. <laughs> I went over to the bench, I laid down, I put one hand on the lines, they grabbed my other hand and pulled it over to the side. It was damn near like a slingshot. It was amazing the power I got to chuck my armpits. I brought that bar down. Boom! It's like I didn't have to lift the weight. I bet you I got between a kilo and a half and two kilos out of that food the room. <laughs> this is kind of material. That's sheer genius. First guy to do a bench press show. First guy to use wraps and it won't rip. I just would have had one guy wrap them both at the same time rather than two different ones. Some strange experience is the reason I tell you about some of these injuries. As I say, the measure of men is how you react on a bad day. You know, oftentimes we do events. I bet you're dying to hear about that argument with John, with uh, Mr. Jordan Savickas and myself. Or not. You don't really care? Somebody was going to get their ass whipped that day. And I, I can tell you what happened, but I'd have to, you'd have to swear to secrecy. Promise? All right, I'm gonna set the premise here, just how it happened. We knew over the years it was gonna come to fruition. Zadrunas and Kaz finally deciding who the hell is the strongest in the history of the world. I think it's rather obvious. I figured it out, and I was gonna confront Z and tell him face to face. I cornered him one day. Not quite the size of an elevator, but a bit like your backyard. Five by five meters. Little, maybe a wooden fence all the way around. Nobody's getting out of there alive, right? One guy is gonna be left standing. Two eight-year-old boys, best friends. And I say, Sejunas, you did a 500-pound log. You're the strongest man in the history of the world. And I walk, I walk away and he goes, no, no, no. You were three times in a row the world's strongest man. In a row. You're the strongest man in the history of the world. I go, Z, you won IFSA, you won world's strongest man. You were a powerlifting champion. He goes, no. You were the first powerlifting champion and world's strongest man at the same time and had three of the four world records in power. We're going back and forth. Two eight-year-olds arguing. It's awesome. I think he's the strongest. He thinks I'm the strongest. You decide who's the strongest in the world. Ever. I vote for Zanurdus the Vegas. Brian Shaw may want me to vote for him sometime. He's three times world's strongest man, but not three in a row. <laughs> Just saying. I don't know. Just saying. So it's fun to try to sort all this stuff out. When you lived it, it's a whole lot different than when you view it. I was in front of some seven, seven through 11 year old kids just the other day in, in uh, Harrogate in England, about 200 of them. They got a bit of a, uh, I don't know what they call it, the headmaster comes up and they were playing football or playing with their balls before kids came early in the morning and they got a bit of a ball at him. And he kind of straightened them out. And then they started a film of me doing World's Strongest Man YouTube stuff. And they watched that for about six, seven minutes. And then I started to talk. And I asked those young kids, what did you see? What do you think? Well, they saw me lifting heavy logs overhead. They saw the bandage on my arm and didn't realize that I was like one of the kids in their class who had broken her leg and had a cast on her leg and was gonna have to heal. I thought when I watched those things, I lived it. I felt it. I understood the excruciating pain from many things that I did. That the events that they were watching were set up by W. Edmonds for John Paul Sigmundson, who had seen the events literally a dozen times over three months. And then they took those events and put them in the competition and wouldn't tell me what the events were. Why would I care? 
These kids just were competing, were, were watching me compete. But I don't care so dearly because when John Paul Sigmund's best squat is 780, and I get 10 reps at 800, 5 fives at 775, 3 fives at 805, a set of 5 at 850, a triple at 900, his best squat is 780. His best bench is 480. My light day in bench was 475 for three sets of 12. It's my light day, okay? My deadlift, two sets of five, eight and a quarter. His best deadlift, 830 for one. Do I really care what the events are in a strongest man competition against John Paul Sigmundson? <laughs> he was a boy when he was competing against Capes. And if I tell you what happened in those events with, with Jeff Capes, it all started with a tug of war in 82. 81, hell, I don't know, it's 35 years ago. We had a tug of war, and we did it for a few minutes. I had already beaten Jeff Gates in the competition. I won the competition by 28 and a half points. They asked me often, was it really a rivalry between you and Jeff Gates? Or was that just TV hype? And my question back is, do you not have to have a rival for there to be a rivalry? And you beat somebody by 28 and a half points? He can't carry my gym bag. How the hell is he going to be a rival? So in tug of war, if I go against him and beat him, Lars Hedlund will be the second, and I'm still the first. And I get a thousand from Lars, and I get a thousand from the networks. So I go to pull against Jeff. Oh, and he's making all these faces, and he's winking like we're buddies. I'm tuned in, turned on, and ready to kick some ass. English ass at that. As I start to back pedal with the rope down below my belt in a strategic position, low as I could get it against my hip, his belt just so happened in all his athleticism to slide up over his belt and high on his trunk. Being such a great athlete as he claims, you'd think he would have strategized and gotten in a little better position. As I pedaled and pedaled, and beat him by more than a meter, meter and a half. I'm leading. His athleticism is not going to it, pull him out of this. I dug down as hard and fast as I could. Lo and behold, the earth shook beneath my feet. As it opened, there was a boulder that I put my heel on. I'm putting all this pressure against Jeff on that boulder down low in my hips. For nine minutes, we did a tug of war. He quit. I kind of like seeing guys that call themselves champions quit. The problem was the next year, he helped organize the show. They left Kazmaier in America. They brought a few power lifters, those static strength guys. He's an athlete, and that's what he claims in the show. And he wins. If you look at John Paul, he's a twig at the time. He's a young boy named the three. In 84, he's a little bigger, and he beats Jeff. Jeff. They go back and forth for a couple years. I'm nowhere to be found. I finally show up, and it's all John Paul's events. My triceps ripped off. I'm doing the best I can. You see a lot of animosity coming out of me. You see a lot of bad memories from being screwed over. But let's just take one of the locals, Gary Taylor. When I was the first to do all five of the McLaughlin stones, I saw them and I tried one, two, three, four. Struggled because I couldn't hold on. I wasn't, one pectoral's thrown off. It's a little tough to lift the stones without a pack and a bicep and belt right on that one side. Just saying. And I asked them if I could have some tacky glue in like they were doing. Nah, Bill, we don't have enough for you. But I got to the fifth one and I didn't know what to do, so I, I didn't know what lapping was. And I picked it up and dropped it and said, huh. Well, I went back to the drawing board. And the following week, we did it again. And when it was my turn to go, I simply lifted the first stone, the third stone, the fifth, did the fourth, and the second. And said, voila, Forgotten Stones country. And one of the guys said, 
but, but you, you went out of order. I said, you're out of order. I'm cast, it's my world, all five stones on top of the barrels, end of story. They didn't really argue. <laughs> Who would argue? As Phil Fister puts it, under that mild and meek, warm and fuzzy skin, that really wonderful, soft, kind person, there's a raging animal that can come out and bam, rock your world just like that. You don't know what you get. The world's strongest thing, the world's strangest thing, the man who's ready and willing to sacrifice parts of his body in the field of battle to lift more weight than anybody else did, no matter what. There has never been, there never will be another like him. What do you think? It seems to be working. <laughs> <laughs>